the book of Habakkuk today. We're going to be in the book of Habakkuk, three chapters again. A lot of these minor prophets have three chapters, and if you remember the spot for Nahum last week, we're just next door, or two weeks ago, we're just next door in the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk today, understanding God's call on us as the righteous to live by faith. The book of Habakkuk, all three chapters today. Let's begin in prayer. Father, we come to you and we thank you for your ever-present call upon our lives to walk with you. To live trusting you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, through your word, through your ever-consistent character, or that we would be people that live by faith in uncertain times, in good times, looking forward to when our faith will become sight, rejoicing in the day when all our confidence, all our hope is realized. Lord, help us today to be convicted and to live by faith. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Habakkuk of the prophets, especially the minor prophets, is unique for the reason that his book is a complaint to God about the prosperity of the wicked and God's long-suffering delay of judgment. Additionally, within this complaint, Habakkuk also addresses the concern that many of us and many in his day had that God will destroy the righteous with the wicked when he judges. The response of God to these two questions is the same. The righteous shall live by faith. It may very well be that we are in the days like that of Habakkuk, that the judgment of God may be already pronounced specifically even upon our nation, and it's but the long-suffering of God that is holding back the full force of God's judgment upon us. And if not our nation, we know that we are living at least in the very beginning of the last days since the ascension of Jesus Christ. And surely judgment has been pronounced and is being enacted upon our earth, and it's only God's long-suffering that prevents it from consuming everything right now. And as we await this righteous judgment, even as we've seen over the, the past few weeks, as we see wickedness and wicked people seemingly prevailing in our day, as we tremble at the thought of God's judgment being unleashed, the answer for us is the same answer in Habakkuk's day. Live by faith. I point us to the book of Habakkuk today, beginning in chapter 1, looking at the first uh, four verses there, verses 2 to 5. Uh, the first verse really is an introduction uh, of Habakkuk here as a, a prophet who receives an oracle. And picking up in verse 2 to see that God, be merciful, God being gracious, delays his judgment. Even as we read in our scripture reading, God is not slow like we think of slowness, but doesn't want anyone to perish. 
And so God, being merciful and gracious, actually delays his judgment. Look at the passage with me, if you would. Here, Habakkuk complaining to God. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? God, the wicked seem to be winning. How long do I have to keep crying out, God? Verse 3. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Why does it seem, God, you're not doing anything about this? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. This is God's response. Maybe as these verses were read, you thought of our own country. Violence everywhere. The wicked seem to be prospering. They seem to be winning. And even as we cry out, much like Habakkuk did, God, how long are you going to let this go on? It seems like your very word, your law, seems impotent to do anything. But God says, I'm doing something that you can't even believe if I told it to you. And for this reason, because God is still working, even when it seems like the wicked are winning, that God, who is merciful, who is gracious, delays his judgment. Even though there is violence everywhere, even though there is destruction, even though it seems the law of God is paralyzed and justice is something of the past, even though the wicked surround the righteous and justice is perverted, God is doing something. God is still working, and so he delays his judgment. I'd ask you to push forward to verses 12 to 13, and then we'll jump to chapter 3 and understand that God, who is merciful, who is gracious, when his judgment comes does preserve the righteous. That even though he's working now and his judgment is delayed, it is coming. It is unstoppable, as we've noticed in several of the prophets recently. Who can stand when God comes? But when he does, he preserves the righteous. Chapter 1, verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for a reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent? When the wicked swallows up a man more righteous than he? God, aren't you doing something about this? But his question really is answered there in verse 12. You're from everlasting, so we will not die. 
Because God is who He is, because He is eternal, because He is the Lord, the Holy One, we shall not die. And even the judgments, even the success of the wicked are part of God's design. Even the wrath of mankind will praise God. He's so wonderful and great and immense that even the, the evil of man, even as Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it for evil and God designed it for good. And in doing this, God preserves the righteous because of who he is. We will not die. Down to chapter 3, if you would, starting in verse 17. Chapter 3 and verse 17 Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Now put yourself in the sandals of someone who lives in, agra in an agrarian society. A society who whose next meal depends upon the crops, whose next meal depends upon the, the health of the flocks and the herds. This is scary. When there is no food, when there's no produce of the land, because of God's judgment, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. And then he ends it to the choir master with stringed instruments. One of the details of Habakkuk's book being he writes a psalm at the end. And even when there's no food... Yet I trust God because he makes me like a deer that can leap upon the mountainside. Sure of foot, the God who is my joy, the God of my salvation, who is my strength, the, the one who provides, the one who makes me tread like a deer. Have you ever watched a deer? How they walk, how they run? A little trot thing, very spindly legs. And some of these deer can get pretty, pretty thick, especially when they're expecting, especially when the does are expecting. And uh, we've got a herd in our neighborhood, and this one doe seems to produce twins all the time. She's got at least two sets. She gets pretty big when she has a set of twins. Have you ever wondered, how does those little legs and hooves hold up that deer? God's designed them marvelously so that even as they go across uh, flat ground, they can move quickly. And even upon a, the mountainside as they run up the hill, as they run up the, the side of the mountain, in places that would be hard for us to walk. Because God has designed them to do that. Because God has strengthened them, even designed uh, even what looks like spindly legs to us to perform in ways that amaze us. And here Habakkuk uses that as an illustration to how God is taking care of him even when there is no produce in the land. Even when God's judgment has fallen upon them because of the wicked that God is preserving Habakkuk and the righteous to be like the deer who can go in impossible places. Even as he composes it in a psalm. Because God, who is merciful, who is gracious, preserves the righteous. Peter in his letters deals with this same subject uses even Lot as an illustration. Lot, who even put himself in the position of being in Sodom and Gomorrah, of even vexing his own soul because of the wickedness around him, 
And yet what happened? God sent two angels, two messengers to bring Lot out. God knows how to preserve the righteous when he judges the wicked. And part of the message of Habakkuk to one who is bringing this cry to God, God, the wicked seem to be winning. We're either going to die by the hand of the wicked or we're going to get consumed when you finally judge. God reassures him, I know how to preserve the righteous. God, merciful and gracious, calls the righteous to live by faith. Chapter 2, verses 2 through 4 here. Habakkuk chapter 2, 2 through 4. We see really the, the heart of the book here. The heart and the central message of Habakkuk. That the righteous are to live by faith, and God calls them to that. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. Put it in big letters. Habakkuk, get a billboard out. Here's God's response to Habakkuk's complaint about the, the prosperity of the wicked. His concern about the righteous being consumed and the judgment of God upon the wicked. And God says, Habakkuk, here's the message. Make it big. Write it down. Put it on a billboard so somebody can be running past and still read it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow... Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. God's dealing with the wicked is going to happen at the exact right time. Behold, his soul, that is of the wicked, is puffed up, is not upright within him. But, in contrast... To the wicked. In contrast to the one who who is under the judgment of God, who, who is going to receive the vision at the right time. In contrast to that, the righteous shall live by his faith. The wicked who is so proud of himself, who thinks, I'm getting ahead, I'm winning. The wicked who try and ignore the hand of God's judgment that's already on them and is slowly being unleashed, slow from our perspective. His soul is puffed up. He has, even as the Psalms record for us in multiple places, he seems to have no cares in his life. He doesn't even seem to fear death. Of course, the psalmist there, especially Asaph, then goes, but then I went to the house of God and I considered their end. I know what's going to happen to them. And Habakkuk here is reminded, no matter what's going on out there, even though they seem to be winning, even though my hand is coming, even though the judgment is being given at the exact right time, whether it's in judgment whether it's in an ungodly and wicked world, the answer is the same. The righteous shall live by faith. Paul uses this phrase several times in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. The righteous, those who are right with God. How shall they live but by faith that is trust in God? Back in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, as a, as a qualification, as an explanation of his statement here, we see that the righteous are to live by faith even when evil appeal, appears to prevail. Remember his complaint. We just looked at it but a moment ago. The wicked are winning, God. 
Let's look at it. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear? For years we've been praying for the salvation of our current national leaders. How long, God? Right? Or do I have to keep crying, violence, violence? Will you not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why is there so much evil in this world? Why does it seem like you're idle when wrongs keep happening? Destruction, violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. I think Habakkuk could be writing about our political process. God, why is it this way? Why does it seem the world just seems evil is winning? Why does it seem your word seems impotent? Like the law of God is paralyzed. Like justice is something that we've finally thrown off. God, what do we do when the wicked surround us? When justice, even within our world, within our country, is perverted. When those who are extremely guilty and obviously so seem to to thrive and have no repercussions in this life, and the righteous are condemned. What do you do? What's our response? How are we to live in such a world. The righteous shall live by faith. Trusting God that even when it looks like this, that he is going to prevail. That God has the victory. We saying faith is the victory. What? That overcomes the world. Not just in the future, but even now. The righteous are to live by faith when evil appears to prevail. Even when it seems like it's winning, we still must live by the same trust in God when things are going well. What about when God finally says, enough? What do we do then? Then the righteous are to live by faith when God judges the wicked. Back to chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. The righteous are to live by faith even when God is judging. Are you not from, what, everlasting? O Lord my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. Why, you have, O Lord, have ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. Who is the one doing the judging? God, right? The everlasting one, the holy one, the Lord, the Rock. He's the one that has established these things. He's the one who has ordained these judgments. I think he knows enough and is wise enough and precise enough to judge the wicked and preserve the righteous. Because he has a purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Even when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he, God knows what's happening. When many went into torture and starvation within Soviet Russia for the word of God, for Jesus. God knew what was happening. When many were were dragged by Saul back to Jerusalem to their death, God had ordained that even to bring the one who was persecuted to become a preacher of the gospel. 
the righteous must live by faith even when God is judging the righteous. Genesis 18, we have God preserving Lot when he judges Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain there. And Abraham even contends with God and speaks with God. Could you imagine doing that? Knowing that's God there? Well, let me speak to you. If there's 50 righteous, and it keeps going down and down and down, and still there's not that many in the cities. And yet God goes and rescues Lot. Lot, who had vexed his soul, yet is called righteous. Even when God is judging the wicked, we have to live by the same faith. 2 Peter 2.9, God tells us that he knows how to preserve the righteous while judging the wicked. And so the righteous are to live by faith when God judges the wicked, even when the judgments are unleashed upon the whole world. I'm reminded of the Israelites still in captivity in Egypt. And the plagues came. Could you imagine not having good drinking water for days because the Nile and all the water in the land is blood? It notes there in Exodus that they had to go and dig wells next to the river just to get fresh water. And if you spent all day out there doing bricks and building buildings, have you had time to dig yourself a well to get fresh water? When the hail comes, when the gnats are flying around, did God know how to preserve the righteous when he was judging wicked Egypt. Yeah, they came out with more stuff than they went in with. So we must live by faith even when God is judging the wicked because God, merciful and gracious, calls us to live by faith, calls the righteous, those who are right with him, to live by faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is the famous faith chapter in our Bibles. And it defines faith as an assurance and trust, a confidence that God, by his unchangeable character, is keeping all his promises. Chapter 11, verse 1. It is this sort of trust in God, trust in his character, trust even in his infallible word, that shows us and demonstrates to us that God created all things in six literal days. In fact, in chapter 11 and verse 3 of the book of Hebrews, we know that God, by faith, we know that God created all things in the beginning out of nothing. This sort of faith, this trust... And God allows us to please God, as it says in chapter 11 of Hebrews, like Enoch, who believed God and it was counted to him, and he pleased God. Verses 5 and 6 of chapter 11. The trust that God shows us in Hebrews 11, the trust that we're called to here in Habakkuk, is the same sort of trust, the same sort of faith that moves us to action like it did Noah and Abraham. Noah to create a boat when we've never seen rain. Abraham to leave his home country to go to a land that was promised. To have descendants when he he and his wife have not had children for almost a hundred years. This same trust moves us like it did Moses and changes our hearts to be counted with Christ in reproach rather than enjoy the pleasures of this world. This 
faith that Habakkuk, the book, calls us to entrust our internal souls to the message of the gospel that the person of Jesus Christ died for our sins. Even as Romans 1, 16 and 17 records for us. This faith trusts that you and I cannot do anything to keep the law perfectly and be justified. Instead, we are redeemed by Jesus alone, through faith alone, as Paul uses this very same phrase from Habakkuk in Galatians chapter 3, verses 11 to 14. And so are you and I living by faith. The faith that trusts God in what he says. The faith that trusts God in his character. The faith that trusts dependently, totally on Jesus to pay for our sins. The faith that trusts God and says, when the wicked prosper, God is still working. The faith that trusts God even when the judgment comes and is falling. That God knows how to preserve the righteous while judging the wicked. Do you have that trust today? Or does the present prosperity of the wicked distress you? Do you look around, do you see it happening and go, God, how is this part of your plan? Did you know Habakkuk was there? Habakkuk ended with God's in control. So this pre- does the present prosperity of the wicked distress you? It does trust God. Are you afraid of the coming judgment of God? Well, I get swept away when God judges. Trust God. The righteous will live by faith. If you're not trusting God, then maybe we need to revisit, have you truly trusted him for salvation? Our doubts are there to make us reaffirm our trust. Even when when Habakkuk got overwhelmed, when the psalmist several times got overwhelmed, return to, but I trust God. Are you afraid of the coming judgment of God? The righteous are to live by faith. Same sort of faith now that will bring us to his presence in eternity. Really, it ultimately comes down to this. Are you living by faith? Trust that no no matter what happens, God is good. God is all-powerful. And God is doing what is best for me and for his glory. Are you trusting? Or is your life filled with worry and distress over events, over wickedness, over your own personal state? Are you living by faith? A trust like Job that says, though he slays me, even if God were to kill me right now, Trust Him. Even though I'm going through all these things, I trust my Redeemer because I will see Him. Do you know the disciples struggled with this? Peter, the strongest maybe of them all, after Jesus is crucified. I'm going back to fishing. Who's with me? He had to have some faith reinstilled, didn't he? Are you living by faith? 
Are you trusting God no matter what happens this November, no matter what happens in our political process, no matter what happens in our world, even if, if the trumpet were to sound and the last judgments were to be unleashed today, that you trust God and so prove that you are righteous because you're living by faith. Habakkuk lived in a difficult time. Habakkuk lived in a wicked time. And the answer to his complaint, to his concerns, is the righteous shall live by faith. The faith that says, God is eternal, we shall not die. Faith that says, even though his judgments are unleashed, he has ordained them. That trust in God. Let us pray. Father, come to you that any who have heard your word today, who are struggling, who are unsure if they've trusted in you, if they are trusting in you, if they've trusted in Jesus alone for the salvation promised, the grace given. God, that you would convict of sin through the Holy Spirit and bring them to repentance if they have not yet. Lord, for each of us, we see our world so wicked. We see ideologies pushed as truth. Harmful wickedness that tears apart children. That kills and murders the innocent, innocent for convenience. And we see the failures, the wickedness, the perversion of justice even to the top of our leadership. Lord, help us not to be distressed, but to walk by faith, to know that even these things you are using, even these you have ordained either as judgment or in allowing the wicked to grow, to be puffed up before their fall. God, help us to live by faith even this week. When even it reaches in and touches our personal lives. Or that we would have the response of Joseph and Job. That even the evil of those around us is designed by God for good. And though, even if you were allowed us to be killed, we would trust you. Lord, you are our Redeemer. You are Almighty God. Eternal, powerful. Help us to trust you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.